Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 43 of the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. Okay, so back in 2011, 2011, a year after Ryan and I started TheMinimalists.com, we published our first book. It was called Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. Well, five years later, uh, toward the end of last year, 2015, we decided to update that book. Uh, we, we created an appreciably different second edition, uh, not only with a beautiful new cover, but every single page in that book was refined. You see, uh, while we were rereading that book, Minimalism, uh, to create that second edition last year, we were astonished by how well the book's principles have endured. Uh, during every event, every interview, every podcast, and nearly every conversation we have with our readers, we find ourselves constantly returning to the, the five values that were in that book, the five values of living a meaningful life. Uh, the new edition of Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life has been available in paperback as well as an ebook for the last year or so. Uh, but we recently asked our friend, Justin Mollick, he's the, the talented narrator over at the Optimal Living Daily podcast. Uh, we actually, we hired him to turn this new edition of Minimalism into a beautiful full-length audiobook, just like he did with our other book, the, the essay collection, Essential. Well, guess what? Once again, Justin did not disappoint, and we are so very pleased with the final product that he produced. So pleased, in fact, that uh, we want to share a large chunk of that audiobook with you for free on this podcast. So what you're about to hear is the first 45 minutes from Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life, read by Justin Mollick. Now, just to be clear, this isn't just a snippet or a, a free sample of the book, and we're not publishing uh, this podcast just to encourage you to purchase the full audiobook. Uh, rather, we're, we're trying to give you the book's first two chapters, where Ryan and I detail many of the events and all the anchors that led us to a life of minimalism. And we're trying to give this to you because we think that you will find value in this content, regardless of whether or not you want to listen to the entire two hour and 39 minute audiobook. But if you do find value in this episode, then yes, of course, you are welcome to download the entire unabridged audiobook over on Audible or iTunes or Amazon, and we'll put the links to all three of those sites in the show notes to this episode. So whether you listen to the entire audiobook or you just listen to these first 45 minutes here on this podcast for free, we really hope you find value in what we've created. Okay, uh, that's all for now. Enjoy this audiobook episode of Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. Oh, and one other thing, by the way, if you haven't seen it yet, our documentary, Minimalism, a documentary about the important things, is finally available on Netflix starting December 15th, 2016. Uh, or if you don't have Netflix, you can still watch it on iTunes or Amazon, Google Play, Vimeo, or DVD. And you can check out the, the beautiful trailer to the film or find your preferred viewing platform over at minimalismfilm.com. Okay, really, that, that's it for now, for real. Uh, we hope you enjoy this audio book episode of Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. By the Minimalists, Joshua Fields Milburn and Ryan Nicodemus. Read by Justin Mollick. Music by We. Are you truly happy? Forward. A brief introduction. Conformity is the drug with which many people self-medicate. Not happy? Buy this. Buy that. Buy something. Keep up with the Joneses, the Trumps, the Kardashians. After all, you can be just like them, right? Clearly, this is wrong. We all know this, and yet we continue to try. Day in, day out, we try. We try to keep up, try to measure up, try to live up to societal expectations. We place immense pressure on ourselves to be something or someone we are not. 
Consequently, people are more stressed than ever. We have more pressure put on us than any other time in history. You see it on TV. The toothpick-thin models and rugged, sexiest men alive dominating the screen. This is what you're supposed to look like. You hear it on the radio, the solipsistic, overindulgent, hummer-driving rap stars and champagne-guzzling pop stars promulgating irresponsible living. This is how you're supposed to consume. You notice it at work, the coworker gossip about him and her and, God forbid, you. This is how you're supposed to behave. To have the tallest building in town, you must tear down everyone else's. Suffice it to say, the pressure surrounds us. Or does it? The truth is that nearly all the pressure we feel is completely internal. Sure, this pressure is influenced by external factors, but that doesn't mean we have to take the bait. We needn't succumb to these influences. Because even if you could be a Kardashian or a Trump or a Jones, it wouldn't make you happy. Happiness comes from within, from inside yourself, from living a meaningful life. And that is what this book aims to help you discover. About the Minimalists. This book is ultimately about you and how you can live a meaningful life. But let's talk about us for a moment. We are Joshua Fields Milburn and Ryan Nicodemus, a pair of 30-somethings who write essays about living a meaningful life with less stuff at theminimalists.com, a website with more than 4 million readers. Our story has been featured on the Today Show, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, USA Today, Forbes, Time Magazine, People Magazine, and many other outlets. We both have extensive experience leading large groups of people in corporate America, coaching and developing hundreds of employees to help them grow as individuals and contribute to the world around them. Once upon a time, we were two happy young professionals living in Dayton, Ohio, but we weren't truly happy. We were best friends in our late 20s and we both had great six-figure jobs, fancy cars, big houses, expensive clothes, plenty of toys, and abundance of stuff. And yet with all this stuff, we knew we weren't satisfied with our lives. We weren't fulfilled. We discovered that working 70 or 80 hours a week and buying even more stuff didn't fill the void. It widened it. So we took back control of our lives using the principles of minimalism to focus on what's important. About this book. This book has been a long time in the making. Its initial iteration, conceived in 2010 and completed in March 2011, resulted in a 300-page how-to guide called Minimalism in 21 Days. A 300-page book about becoming a minimalist? This didn't feel right to us. How could a book about minimalism, a book about reducing life's excess, be 300 pages? We could almost taste the irony. Don't get us wrong, it was a good book, far better than most drivel you'll find on the internet, But because we didn't feel it was a great book and because it lacked a necessary brevity, we did what any responsible authors would have done. We scrapped the entire project, published an attenuated version of Minimalism in 21 Days on our website, minimalist.com slash 21 days, and started over with a blank page. It was difficult, but it felt like the only genuine way to create a meaningful book. The result was the first edition of Minimalism Live a Meaningful Life, published in 2011 by Asymmetrical Press. Much has happened, and many lessons have been learned in the five years since we published that first edition. Hence, the book you are reading now, the second edition of Minimalism. While rereading this short book to write this updated edition, we were astonished by how well the book's principles have endured. During every event, every interview, and nearly every conversation we have with readers, we find ourselves returning to the five values in this book. While we won't use the pages of this new edition to expand on the past half decade, our memoir Everything That Remains and our essay collection Essential do a thorough job of that, we significantly updated minimalism by expanding on the five values expressed in this book. Our website provides the ultimate how to start guide for free, as well as frequent updates by way of our online essays which explore minimalism at a deep level, detailing practical ways to apply simple living to your life. We wrote this book to be used in a similar practical way. We certainly don't want to waste your time. The ingredients in this book are designed to provide you with a basic recipe for intentional living, while allowing you to adjust the recipe to suit your own taste and lifestyle. Furthermore, while this entire book can be consumed within a day or two, it is organized into seven succinct chunks, which are better digested in a week, one chapter at a time. This book is different from the content on our website and in our other books. While our website documents our journey into minimalism and our continued growth through experimentation, this book discusses minimalism in a different way. It covers in depth the five values for living a meaningful life. It also provides insight into our personal lives, including the painful events that led us to our journey into minimalism. The book itself is written and organized to help you think about your life and how you live it, to make you do some work and introspection so you can step away from your old life and journey into a new one, 
to help you realize you can change. You can reselect who you're going to be. You can become the best person you're capable of becoming. The real you, the passionate, loving, compassionate, disciplined, happy you. So if you truly want to maximize what you learn from this book, we ask you not only read its content, but also do three things as you read. Read more than once. The first reading primes the pump, but rereading the parts you find most relevant will fuel your desire to take action to change your life. Take notes. Unlike the essays on our website, this book is not designed to be read just once, and it is not a theoretical document. We want you to get the most out of this book, which means taking notes, highlighting certain passages, and making lists to help you better understand yourself. Take action. This is the most important step. If you read this book but do nothing with what you've learned, then you are wasting your time. It's fine to just absorb the information to start, but action is what's going to change your life. We don't overwhelm you with action in these chapters, but we do ask you to make many small adjustments in your life that add up to significant change over time. For all intents and purposes, this is a book of advice. As minimalists, we start with the material possessions, and then once we've cleared the excess, we move beyond the stuff to the most important aspects of life, health, relationships, passions, growth, and contribution. These five values are the fundaments of living a meaningful life. Finally, it is important to note that while we are sharing our 60 combined years of living through these pages, we do not have all the answers. The strategies, experiments, and stories we share in this book are things we've learned from innumerable sources, from Elizabeth Gilbert to Tony Robbins and everyone in between. The common thread, however, is that these are the strategies that have worked well for us and thousands of other people. Although we're all different, we're all looking for the same thing, how to live with more meaning. Chapter one, our arrival. Are you happy? The material possessions we accumulate will not make us happy. We all know this, and yet we often search for life's meaning through accumulating more possessions. Real happiness, however, comes from who we are, from who we've become. Real happiness comes from within. Likewise, discontentment is also a result of who we've become. If you want to base your life on that of the average person, then this book is not for you, because the average person is not happy. And just because most people are unhappy doesn't mean you must be unhappy too. You needn't settle for a mediocre life just because the people around you did. Of course, happiness is not the point. A meaningful life is. We must stop searching for happiness and instead start looking for meaning. If our short-term actions align with our long-term values, we'll find purpose in whatever we're doing. Paradoxically, it is this way of living, living deliberately, that leads to true happiness. Not ephemeral or fleeting happiness, but lasting contentment that is reinforced by a life of discipline, attention, awareness, and intentionality. Happiness is merely a byproduct. Finding discontent. In 2009, life looked great for both of us. We both worked for the same telecommunications corporation, Joshua since 1999, Ryan since 2004. We both enjoyed the perks of a lifestyle most people envied. We both lived our version of the American dream. But for some reason, neither one of us could explain at the time, we were not happy, we didn't feel fulfilled, and we certainly didn't feel content. The topic of happiness began peeking its head into our conversations more frequently as time passed. With each promotion at work, with each award or fancy trip we won, with every nugget of praise we received, The happiness accompanying those things quickly came and went. The faster it came, the faster it left. So we sought happiness by attempting to get more of these nuggets of praise, trying to improve our feelings of self-worth and significance by quote-unquote achieving more. We worked harder and harder to obtain these affirmations of worth, often working twice as many hours as the average American to prove our value. It was something like a cocaine high. The more praise we received, the more we needed it to function, the more we needed it to feel happy. It got to the point where we were living just to break even emotionally. Discontent flooded our lives. We knew something needed to change, but we weren't sure what. So we did what most Americans do. We tried to purchase happiness. Even though we were both earning more than six figures in well-respected positions, we spent more money than we made, purchasing things like luxury cars, large houses, big screen TVs, fancy furniture, expensive vacations, and everything else our heavily mediated consumer culture told us would make us happy but it didn't make us happy. It brought us more depression and discontent because not only did the old feelings stick around, but we piled onto those feelings by going into debt. And when the temporary high from each of our purchases dissipated, we were left feeling depressed, empty, alone, and helpless. 
Then in late 2009, a series of alarming events made Joshua begin to question every aspect of his life, including his material possessions, his career, his success, and the meaning of life. A slow burn. But let's rewind our story a bit because our discontent didn't suddenly descend from the heavens, striking us like a bolt of lightning. We didn't wake up one morning and say, gee, everything was fine yesterday, but today I'm unhappy. Discontentment doesn't work that way. Rather, it's a slow burn. It's a pernicious problem that creeps into your life after years of subtle dissatisfaction. It started when we were young. The first signs of discontent appeared in our lives well before our days in corporate America. It started when we were children. The two of us met 20 years ago in the fifth grade. We were 10 years old, living near Dayton, Ohio, and even by then, our lives were filled with discontent. We both grew up in dysfunctional households during the 1980s, before dysfunctional was a common term. Both sets of our parents were divorced. Joshua's parents separated when he was three. His mother succumbed to alcoholism, forcing him to raise himself most years after age six. His bipolar, schizophrenic father died when he was nine. Ryan's mother had similar substance abuse issues, which later led to substance abuse for Ryan as a young adult. Both of us were raised in less than ideal conditions for much of our childhoods, which in retrospect was a recipe for disaster. By age 12, we were both overweight, uncool, and utterly unhappy with our lives. We did things to try to escape. Back then, the easiest escape was food. We experienced instant gratification by stuffing our faces. We felt certain we would be happy, at least for a moment. Food was one of the few aspects of our lives we could control because everything else felt so out of control. We lived in dilapidated, cockroach-infested apartments with single mothers who cared about us, but who were more concerned with getting drunk or high than providing for their children. As we approached high school, Ryan moved into his father's home, a much stabler household. His father owned a small wallpapering company and was able to provide a better, lower-middle-class lifestyle. Ryan's father was the antithesis of his mother. He held a stable job, he showed he cared in myriad ways, and he was a devout Jehovah's Witness. The long list of positive changes was too much for Ryan to handle all at once, so while he did his best to conform to the strict household rules, he also rebelled, experimenting with alcohol, marijuana, and harder drugs. Joshua took a different route. While he didn't indulge in alcohol or drugs because he was so turned off by his mother's rampant alcoholism, he found another way to cope, namely obsession and compulsion in the form of OCD. He discovered that even though he couldn't control his living situation, the tumble-down apartment, the drunken mother, the lack of money, he could control himself. So he lost a lot of weight during his freshman year in high school in an unhealthy way by eating very little, and he spent hours organizing his meager possessions, obsessing over the smallest things, searching for some kind of order in a world of chaos. During our last year of high school in 1998, we had a memorable conversation that unknowingly became the tipping point that led us into the chaos and confusion of consumerism. Because we grew up relatively poor, we thought the key to our happiness would be money. Specifically, if we could just make $50,000 a year, then we'd be set. Our parents hadn't earned that kind of money, and they weren't happy, so we figured if we could pass an arbitrary threshold, $50,000 in this case, then we would somehow be happy. It sounds ridiculous now, but it made perfect sense to a couple 18-year-olds about to enter the world on their own. We graduated high school in 1999, and we went in separate directions for a few years. Neither of us went to college straight away. Instead, we both entered the working world. Ryan worked for his father, hanging wallpaper and painting walls in opulent houses throughout Southwest Ohio. Joshua found a sales job with a large corporation. Both careers were steeped in certain monetary expectations. Neither of us particularly enjoyed what we were doing, but we didn't know any better. We didn't realize you could actually do work you enjoyed. For us, our jobs were designed to do two things for our lifestyle, allow us to make money and give us a certain kind of social status. Ryan was making enough money to live. It wasn't great money, but it paid the bills. He also earned an identity from his job. A fleet of half a dozen paint trucks, Nicodemus plastered on the side of each, patrolled the streets of Warren County, Ohio, silently speaking volumes about his future. There was comfort in knowing that one day he would take over his father's business, making it his own and maybe even passing it on to his future children. But Ryan also knew the painting business wouldn't make him rich. He was painting multi-million dollar homes, which he knew he'd never afford himself, even when he took over his dad's business, which if he worked really hard, he'd do once his dad retired in a decade or two. There was a fair amount of discontent that showed up for Ryan, realizing he would never be able to get something he wanted. At the time, he didn't know why he wanted a palatial home or why it would make him happy. He was merely unhappy that he would never afford such luxuries. So Ryan searched for contentment in other ways. 
Joshua found a job at which he had the potential to earn more money than the people with whom he went to high school, a job that had long-term career growth possibilities. All he had to do was work like a sled dog to quote-unquote get results. So work like a dog he did, often working more than a month straight, seven days a week without a day off. The more he worked, the more he sold. And the more he sold, the more money he earned and the more he was showered with praise. At 18, he was already making more money than his mother ever had. He was poised for corporate greatness, at least ostensibly. But Joshua experienced discontent too. Although he was making more than $50,000 by 19, he had little personal time. The corporate world of performing and achieving was taking its toll, so he tried to purchase happiness, attempting to manufacture a life of contentment. Manufactured Contentment Unhappy with our jobs and our lives, we try to fix our discontent in different ways. Ryan turned to a few extremes. First, he turned back to his father's religion, the religion of his childhood, swearing off drugs and worldly activities, becoming a devout Jehovah's Witness, embracing his tenets and searching for life's meaning through religion. Ryan married his high school girlfriend at 18, a few months after graduating high school. He and his wife adopted the JW lifestyle, got a mortgage for a small house in the hometown in which they were raised, and started talking about creating a family together. But it became a marriage saturated with fear and distrust. After three years of tedious matrimony, the marriage ended nastily, upon which Ryan turned back to drugs and alcohol, searching for an escape from his painful failed reality. Joshua, on the other hand, continued his laser-focused work in corporate America, consistently performing as one of the best salespeople in the company. He earned his first promotion to a leadership position at 22, making him the youngest person in the company's 130-year history to have earned the position. With this promotion came more money, more responsibility, and even more work. Joshua's life was consumed by work. At 23, he got married, built a large house in suburbia, and continued to work more and more as his personal life passed by in the unfocused background. He hardly realized he had gotten married. He neglected and took for granted the relationship with his wife. He hardly spent time in their large house, which contained more bedrooms than inhabitants. Above all, he avoided the discontent brewing within him. He knew he wasn't happy, but he'd get there one day, right? And so life went on at its breakneck pace. To deal with his more subtle discontent, Joshua tried to buy his happiness. He spent money on stuff, buying fancy clothes, expensive vacations, consumer electronics, multitudes of unnecessary junk. When those things didn't bring lasting happiness, he turned to his childhood vice of food. By his early 20s, he weighed more than ever. He was 70 pounds overweight and severely out of shape. But at least I'm making money, he thought, giving himself an identity in his career, a kind of status and satisfaction in knowing he performed well at his job, albeit a job he wasn't passionate about. Reconnecting the duo. It was around this time that we reconnected, almost accidentally, at the nadir of our early 20s. Ryan decided that taking over his father's business was not for him. He didn't know what he wanted to do with his life, but he figured he'd give the corporate world a shot. Because if he could just make over $50,000 a year, then life would be good and he would be happy, right? So in 2004, shortly after Joshua got married and Ryan got divorced, Joshua hired Ryan to work at the corporation at which he had slayed for the last half decade. Like Joshua, Ryan quickly excelled, working exceptionally hard, becoming one of the company's top performing salespeople. We both earned several more promotions over the years during our mid and late 20s, promotions with fancy titles like channel manager, regional manager, and director. And with those titles came more money and more responsibility and more work. Sadly, far darker things came with those promotions as well. Anxiety and stress and worry and overwhelm and depression. And yet, try as we did, our search for happiness through status and material possessions never yielded real, lasting happiness or contentment. By our late 20s, we were earning great money at jobs we disliked, but we were in debt, financially and emotionally. Back to the future. Fast forward back to 2009, back to our 80-hour work weeks, back to our ostensibly perfect lives that were crumbling on the inside. On October 8, 2009, Joshua's mother died of stage four lung cancer. She battled it over a year, enduring repeat chemo and radiation treatments. But as the cancer spread to her brain and other organs, she was no match for the disease in the end. Oddly enough, the cancer seemed to be a metaphor for Joshua's life. While things looked good on the surface, the marriage, the fancy job, the cars, the trinkets of success, there was something seriously wrong on the inside. Neither of us was happy. When we told ourselves a decade earlier we'd be happy if we could just make $50,000 per year, we were wrong. At first, in our early 20s, 
We thought maybe we had simply miscalculated the exact amount required to be happy, so we changed our estimation. If we could make $60,000 per year, then we could be happy, right? And when that didn't work, if we could make $75,000, and then $90,000, and then $100,000 per year, then we could be happy, right? It was a never-ending cycle. Each year we made more money, and each year we spent more than we earned in an effort to subdue our perpetual discontent created by the lifestyles we were living. The equation itself was broken. A week after Joshua's mother died, we had another conversation about happiness. We discussed why we weren't happy and what it would take to make us happy. Obviously, the old formula of if we could make X dollars, then we could be happy was not panning out. We were both making over six figures. We were both successful 28-year-old young executives and we both quote-unquote had it figured out according to cultural standards, but we didn't have it figured out at all. Was this what we had been waiting for our entire lives? Were we going to continue to work ridiculously long hours at a corporation that didn't care about us? Were we going to work our way into upper management, becoming COOs or CEOs with seven or eight figure salaries, just to be even more depressed by the time we were in our 40s? It didn't sound appealing to us. Our dreams of climbing the corporate ladder seemed more like nightmares the more we talked about it. The death of Joshua's mother put everything into perspective. We have only a finite amount of time on this earth. It can be spent accumulating monetary wealth or it can be spent in a meaningful way, the latter of which doesn't necessarily preclude someone from the former, but the relentless pursuit of riches doesn't lead to a meaningful life. So we decided to take an inventory of our lives. We wanted to find out what was making us unhappy and what we needed to do to change those things in our lives so we could experience happiness, passion, freedom. Anchors. First, we identified our anchors. We had discovered getting what we wanted, large houses, bigger paychecks, material possessions, and corporate awards, wasn't making us happy. So we wanted to identify what was anchoring us, what was making us feel stuck and preventing us from growing. The concept of anchors struck a chord with both of us. It forced us to take an honest look in the mirror and identify everything we thought might be holding us back from living happy, fulfilled lives. The exercise we performed was simple. Over the course of one week, each of us wrote down anything we thought might be an anchor. The first step to solving a problem is to identify the problem, right? As the week progressed, our lists of anchors grew, and by the end of the week, Joshua had counted 83 anchors and Ryan, 54. Plenty of anchors. Our next step was to identify our priorities. We started prioritizing by dividing our anchors into two categories, major anchors and minor anchors. Major anchors were the most obvious things keeping us from feeling free, including our houses, namely the large mortgage payments that went with them, certain relationships with people, namely unhealthy relationships that didn't add value to our lives, car payments and other large bills, major debts, our careers, and anything else that demanded an inordinate amount of time without returning commensurate value to our lives. Minor anchors made up the bulk of our lists and included cable bills, internet bills, other bills, smaller debts, unused clothes, unused household items, household clutter, certain unproductive peripheral relationships, daily drive time, and other small things that consume small amounts of our time, attention, and focus. We decided that ridding ourselves of many of these anchors over a period of time would let us reclaim much of our own time, which could then be spent in more meaningful ways. Because the major anchors appear to be the hardest to tackle, we started with those first. For example, every extra penny Joshua earned was spent on making extra payments toward his debts. No more trips, vacations, or fancy dinners. All his money went toward paying off his car and his vast credit card debt, which despite a healthy income had climbed to an unbelievable level, greater than six figures. Eventually, over a two-year period, we paid off our cars and paid down our debts. Other major anchors were addressed in a similar fashion. We eventually jettisoned many of our possessions, eliminating the excess in favor of things we liked and enjoyed, things we actually used in our daily lives. Over the course of two years, our anchors of old were no longer weighing us down. Making Difficult Decisions Because some of the major anchors involved our relationships with other people, some tough decisions had to be made. Soon after Joshua's mother died, Joshua decided his marriage of nearly six years wasn't working. He knew that neither he nor his wife was happy, that neither of their values or desires were aligned, and that they both wanted vastly different things from life. They loved each other and wanted to find a way to make their marriage work, so they sat down and discussed their differences and worked on a plan to save their marriage. They attended marriage counseling and took steps to come into better alignment working together for months in an effort to repair a broken marriage. Their differences, however, were too great, so Joshua and his wife decided to part ways. It was the hardest decision he ever had to make. 
Thankfully, as time passed, they were able to remain close friends who still care about each other deeply. Furthermore, Josh was faced with the dilemma of what to do with his mother's stuff after her death, what to do with those sentimental items we tend to hold on to in perpetuity. His mother had lived a thousand miles away in Florida, and after she passed, it was his responsibility to vacate her small one-bedroom apartment brimming with belongings. His mother had an interior decorator's good taste, so none of her stuff was junk in the hoarder's sense of the word, which made letting go of anything difficult. Nevertheless, there was a lot of stuff in her home, likely three or more apartments is worth in her tiny dwelling, so he knew some things would have to go. His mom had lived her life as a constant shopper, always accumulating more stuff. She had antique furniture throughout her apartment, a stunning oak canopy bed that consumed almost her entire bedroom, two closets bulging with clothes, picture frames standing on every flat surface, original artwork hanging on the walls, and creative decorations in every nook and cranny and crevasse, 64 years of accumulations. So Joshua did what any son would do. He rented a large U-Haul truck. Then he called a storage facility back in Ohio to make sure they had a big enough storage unit. The truck was $1,600. The storage facility was $120 per month. Financially, the cost was expensive, but he quickly discovered the emotional cost was much higher. At first, Joshua didn't want to let go of anything. If you've lost a loved one or you've been through a similarly emotional time, then you understand exactly how hard it was for him to let go of any of those possessions. So instead of letting go, he planned to cram every trinket and figurine and piece of oversized furniture into that tiny storage locker in Ohio, floor to ceiling. That way he knew mom's stuff was there if he ever wanted it, if he ever needed access to it for some incomprehensible reason, just in case. The week after her death, Joshua began boxing up her belongings, every picture frame, every porcelain doll, every doily on every shelf. He packed every bit of her that remained, or so he thought. Then, he looked under the bed. Among the organized chaos that compromised the crawl space beneath her bed, there were four boxes, each labeled with a number. One, two, three, four. Each numbered box was sealed with packing tape. Joshua cut through the tape and found old papers from his elementary school days, grades one through four. Spelling tests, cursive writing lessons, artwork, it was all there, every shred of paper from his first four years of school. It was evident she hadn't accessed the sealed boxes in years, and yet she had held on to these things because she was trying to hold on to pieces of her son, pieces of the past, much like Joshua was attempting to hold on to pieces of her and her past now. That's when he realized his retention efforts were futile. He could hold on to her memories without her stuff, just as she had always remembered him and his childhood and all their memories without ever accessing those sealed boxes under her bed. She didn't need papers from 25 years ago to remember her son, just as her son didn't need a storage locker filled with her belongings to remember her. So Joshua called U-Haul and canceled the truck. Then over the next 12 days, he donated almost all her stuff to places and people who could actually use it. Of course, it was difficult to let go, but Joshua learned several lessons during this experience. We are not our stuff. We are more than our possessions. Our memories are within us, not our things. Our stuff weighs on us mentally and emotionally. Old photographs can be scanned. You can take pictures of items you want to remember. Items that are sentimental for us can be useful to others. Letting go is freeing. We don't think sentimental items are bad or evil or that holding on to them is wrong. Rather, we think the malign nature of sentimental items is far more subtle. If you want to get rid of an item, but the only reason you are holding on to it is for sentimental reasons, if it's weighing on you, if it's an anchor, then perhaps it's time to get rid of it. Perhaps it's time to free yourself of the weight. That doesn't mean you need to get rid of everything, though. One by one, over time, the two of us tackled many of our anchors, big and small. In the process of tackling our anchors, we searched for ways to do so more efficiently. We searched for examples of people who had overcome their fears, who had freed themselves of their anchors and started living more meaningful lives. This is how we stumbled upon the concepts of minimalism. Discovering Minimalism In late 2009, shortly after Joshua's mother had died, while his marriage was in shambles and we were both unhappy with our current nose-to-the-grindstone situations, Joshua came across a website called Exile Lifestyle, developed by a guy named Colin Wright. We were intrigued by Colin's website. Here was this young, 24-year-old entrepreneur living an amazing life, a seemingly impossible life. He left his high-paying career to pursue his passions, traveling the world and running his businesses from anywhere. His website, what he called a blog, a term we were unfamiliar with at the time, documented his travels and allowed his thousands of readers to participate in his journey. Colin's readers vote on where he will travel next. 
We were amazed that this guy left everything to travel to a new country every four months. Not that we wanted to travel that extensively ourselves, we didn't, but we did want to have the freedom to pursue our own passions, which we discovered weren't inside the corporate juggernaut. Colin also used a term with which we were utterly unfamiliar. He said he was a minimalist. On his website, he wrote about how this movement called minimalism allowed him to focus on the important stuff in his life while shedding the excess junk that had gotten in the way. This was fascinating. It was like someone turned on the light bulb for us for the first time and presented us with a tool to help us weed through the clutter in our lives to finally get to what was important. Because he traveled, Colin owned only 72 things at the time. There were pictures of all his possessions on his website, and all of his possessions fit into a bag he carried with him while he traveled. The most striking part about this story was Colin's contentment. He exuded happiness and excitement and passion. He loved his life. Although we deeply respect Colin, we didn't want to live like him. We didn't want to travel the world or live with fewer than 100 things. But we did want the freedom that his minimalist lifestyle afforded him. And we wanted the happiness and passion that accompanied that freedom. So during the first half of 2010, we slowly removed our anchors one by one as we followed Colin's journey. But at 30, maybe we were too old and too rooted to become minimalists. Maybe this minimalism thing was only for young guys without many possessions who wanted to travel extensively. We discovered that wasn't true either. Through Colin, we discovered two other minimalists who were in many ways much like us, Leo Babauta and Joshua Becker. Leo Babauta, creator of the website Zen Habits, had a story that resonated with us immediately. He was a once-divorced man in his mid-30s who overcame scads of adversity to live more meaningfully. Using minimalism to simplify his life, he had accomplished some amazing feats in just a few years. He quit smoking, lost 70 pounds, gotten into the best shape of his life, climbed out of debt, moved from Guam to San Francisco, and quit his corporate job but was still able to provide for his wife and six children. Similarly, 30-something Joshua Becker, a husband and father of two living in Vermont, simplified his suburban family life using minimalism while maintaining his job at a local church and helping other people learn more about minimalism through his website, Becoming Minimalist. Leo Babauta and Joshua Becker proved to us minimalism wasn't only for single guys who didn't want to work a nine-to-five. It was for anyone interested in living a simpler, more intentional life. It was for anyone who wanted to focus on the important aspects in life, rather than the material possessions so heavily linked to success and happiness by our culture. In fact, on our website, we have a page dedicated to defining minimalism in a tongue-in-cheek way, poking fun at the cynics and skeptics who treat minimalism as a trend or fad. We start our definition with, To be a minimalist, you must live with fewer than 100 things, and you can't own a car or a home or a TV, and you can't have a career, and you have to be able to live in exotic places all over the world, and you have to write a blog, and you can't have children, and you have to be a young white male from a privileged background. Okay, we're joking, obviously, but people who dismiss minimalism as a fad usually mention some of the above quote-unquote restrictions as to why they could quote-unquote never be a minimalist. The truth is, minimalism isn't about any of those things, but it can help you accomplish almost all that stuff if you're so inclined. If you desire to live with fewer than 100 things or not own a car or travel all over the world, minimalism can help, but that's not the point. The point is, minimalism is a tool to help you achieve freedom, Freedom from fear, freedom from worry, freedom from overwhelm, freedom from guilt, freedom from depression, freedom from enslavement, freedom, real freedom. A minimalist can, however, own a car and a house and have children and a career. Minimalism looks different for everyone because it's about finding what is essential to you. There are tons of successful minimalists who do some or all of these things. See minimalist.com slash links for a list of minimalists. So how can they all be so different and yet still be minimalists? That brings us back to our original question, what is minimalism? Minimalism is a tool we use to live a meaningful life. There are no rules. Rather, minimalism is simply about stripping away the unnecessary things in your life so you can focus on what's important. Ultimately, minimalism is the thing that gets us past the things so we can focus on life's most important things, which actually aren't things at all. Minimalism has helped us in several ways, including reclaiming our time, ridding ourselves of excess stuff, enjoying our lives, discovering meaning in our lives, living in the moment, focusing on what's important, pursuing our passions, finding happiness, doing anything we want to do, finding our missions, experiencing freedom, creating more, consuming less. How has minimalism helped us with these things? Minimalism is a lifestyle choice. Minimalists choose to get rid of the unnecessary in favor of what's important. But the level of specificity is up to you. Minimalists search for happiness not through things, but through life itself. 
Thus, it's up to you to determine what is necessary and what is superfluous to your life. Throughout this book, we will give you some ideas of how to determine these things and how to achieve a minimalist lifestyle without succumbing to a strict code or a set of rules. A word of warning, it isn't easy to take the first few steps, but the journey gets much easier and more rewarding the further you go. But the first steps into minimalism often take radical changes in mindset, actions, and habits. So if we had to sum it up in one sentence, we would say, Minimalism is a tool to eliminate life's excess, focus on the essentials, and find happiness, fulfillment, and freedom. Embracing Minimalism It was as our lives were spiraling downward in ever-diminishing circles toward oblivion that we embraced minimalism. It was a beacon in the night. We feverishly scoured internet page after internet page looking for more information and guidance and enlightenment, watching and learning and trying to understand what this whole minimalism thing was about. Through months of research, while we removed our anchors, we traveled further and further down the rabbit hole, and over time we discovered a group of people without a lot of things, but with myriad happiness and passion and freedom, things for which we desperately yearned. Eventually, we embraced these concepts, the concepts of minimalism and simplicity, as a way of life, and we discovered we too could be happy, but it wasn't through owning more stuff, it wasn't through accumulation. We took back control of our lives so we could focus on what's important, so we could focus on life's deeper meaning. Happiness, as far as we are concerned, is achieved internally through living a meaningful life, a life that is filled with passion and freedom, a life in which we can grow and contribute to others in meaningful ways. These are the bedrocks of happiness, not stuff. Creating the Minimalists In the summer of 2010, we had no intentions of writing nonfiction online or starting a website about minimalism, but then almost accidentally, Joshua met Colin Wright in person while on a trip to New York City in June. Meeting Colin solidified his online persona. His personality shone through in person, displaying layers of happiness and contentment that didn't seem possible to a discontented man approaching 30, living on the corporate continuum. They met in Manhattan after connecting on Twitter. Joshua had been writing fiction throughout his 20s, whenever he had a free moment outside of work. He knew Colin earned a living online by publishing his own material, so he wanted to pick Colin's brain about self-publishing. When they met for lunch, Colin encouraged Joshua to explore the non-traditional route of publishing his fiction, citing several resources that will later become helpful. See asymmetrical.co slash how-2 for a list of resources. They stayed in contact after that initial meeting and eventually worked on several projects together, including Colin's memoir, My Exile Lifestyle, and Joshua's novel, As a Decade Fades. During that meeting, Colin said one thing that stuck with Joshua, the one thing that led him to team up with Ryan to create The Minimalists. You should do something online. You can make a difference. The world needs people like you to help them see things clearly. Josh wrote those words in his journal. They stuck with him long after the meeting. And with those words, we decided to create The Minimalists. We wanted to do two things with our website. We wanted to document our personal journeys into minimalism, and we wanted to help other people live more meaningful lives using minimalism as a foundation. We started building the site in November 2010 and quickly discovered we were clueless about how to create a website, We didn't know the first thing about HTML or blogging or writing nonfiction online. Sure, Joshua had his fiction writing experience, which helped with our writing, but we were clueless about the rest. So we did extensive research and built our site over a six-week time frame, laboring vigorously until the last minute. For an in-depth look at how we created our website, read our essay, How to Start a Successful Blog at minimalist.com slash blog. We officially launched the minimalist.com on December 14th, 2010. And so there we were, two suit and tie corporate guys taking advice from some millennial blogger. We had started a website, documented our entire journey into minimalism, and started writing a few essays a week for the site. Then several months of unexpected excitement transpired, and our lives changed within nine months of creating our website. We met some of the most amazing people on the internet, eventually turning those online relationships into real-life friendships, including the aforementioned Leo Babauta and Joshua Becker, as well as myriad others, among them Julian Smith, Chris Gillibo, and Courtney Carver. With the help of many of these outstanding folks, as well as our small number of initial readers relentlessly sharing our essays, our website grew exponentially. Within nine months, we had over 100,000 monthly readers. By that time, people were spending over 11,000 hours on our site each month. We had been featured on popular websites all over the web. We received the most incredible emails about how we changed people's lives with our essays. As a consequence, we both left our corporate jobs and began focusing full-time on living more meaningful lives. To read more about our exit from the corporate world, read chapter seven of our memoir, Everything That Remains, or Joshua's essay, 
why I walked away from my six-figure career at minimalist.com slash quit. What it means to live a meaningful life. What does it mean to live a meaningful life? Generally, through our essays and books, we speak of minimalism as a tool that has allowed us to pursue more meaningful lives, so it's important we define what this means. After much cerebration, deliberation, discussion, research, and experimentation, we discovered five values that allow us to live a meaningful life. Number one, health. Number two, relationships. Number three, passions. Number four, growth. Number five, contribution. It took us months of removing the anchors from our lives and getting rid of the clutter that surrounded us to uncover these five values. We didn't stumble into them though. Instead, we discovered what was most important in our lives through trial and error. Minimalism made this discovery possible. By 28, everything in our lives seemed foggy. We had everything we were supposed to have, everything our culture advertised would make us happy, and yet we weren't. Worse, we had reached a point at which we didn't know what was important anymore. Getting rid of the clutter in our lives allowed us to rediscover these five key areas. Thus, getting rid of our stuff was the initial bite at the apple, allowing us to make room to fill our lives with more meaningful pursuits. Through months of rigorous documentation, the five values are the areas we changed in our lives that had the largest positive effect and resulted in more satisfaction and contentment for the two of us. The following five chapters discuss each of these concepts in depth, much more so than can be discussed on our website. Throughout these chapters, we consider why these five values are the most important areas of our lives and how minimalism has allowed us to focus on these values, citing personal examples of how we changed our lives in all five areas. The book's final chapter, Confluence, binds together these five values and asks the reader some important questions about their life. These questions are not rhetorical. They are meant to make you think, take notes, and make lists based on those questions. Similarly, as we stated in the book's foreword, We encourage you to actively engage in all the chapters by reading the content more than once, writing notes in the margins, highlighting meaningful passages, making your own lists, and most important, taking action. Ultimately, this book is meant to make you take little actions each day that will radically improve your life over time. Let's begin, shall we? Finally, here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. This is Kristen from Asheville, North Carolina, and I was listening to your podcast talking about unwrapping the banana, and I just had another idea to give experiences to kids. I was thinking, why don't you put in little mini gift bags, a card, a gift card for a family movie night, or even little invitations like one dinner date with mommy, one long walk with daddy, Um, whatever the case, just make them family experiences, almost like coupons, but put them in little gift bags. My name is Jamie Himbree. I am from Shawnee, Oklahoma. There have been a lot of questions about how to navigate gift giving and children um, on a number of the podcasts, not just the holiday podcast. And I wanted to share a tip my mom did when I was growing up that tremendously impacted me and instilled some of the same values um, that we often talk about with minimalism. I was always allowed to ask for anything I wanted, um, but my mom would always pause and ask me, that's fine, we can get that, but what is it that you're willing to give up or give away in order to make space for the new item? So I often had to choose something that I already loved, and just taking the time as a child to pause and decide whether the new thing I loved more and it was worth getting rid of the thing I already had and loved would make me not want the new thing. Otherwise, I was always allowed to pick an event or an activity to go do in lieu of a material gift where I kept my current possessions and we would go to a movie or my favorite restaurant or the zoo. Hey, Josh and Ryan, this is Jared McDaniel from Chattanooga, Tennessee. I was just calling in response to your holiday episode. Just listen to it, and as always, uh, great stuff. Thanks for sharing. And specifically wanted to comment about how to talk to kids about Santa Claus. So my daughter is only a year old, so I haven't played with it yet. But what my parents did with my brother and I, in hindsight, thinking about it as a parent, was actually really, really cool. So what they did was they didn't, 
have a hard line of yes, Santa Claus is real or no, Santa Claus isn't real. So we were the kids at school saying, you know, Santa Claus is not real and breaking everybody's heart. So what they said was that Santa Claus represented uh, the spirit of giving. And so that was pretty neat because that allowed us to kind of let our childhood imagination enjoy the, you know, some of the magic of the holidays and things that, uh, that, that you get to as a kid. And uh, it also had the positive connotation that the holidays and things around the holidays were more about what we can give as opposed to receive. And so in hindsight, I think I did a pretty good job of going about it that way and just wanted to share in case that adds value to anybody else. All right, y'all, that's it for this episode. If you have a question for The Minimalists, give us a call, 406-219-7839. And if you leave here with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things, because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Every little thing that you gotta have Every little thing that you gotta have you gotta reach for and you gotta grab oh i bet that you'll be fine without it so tear your eyes away or tear